think it's only due to war. There was an element of patriotism when we were learning this dance because it was so directly involved with our soldiers. I know it was composed in a prisoner war camp during the Second World War, and it's danced at reels and, and country dances length and breadth of Scotland. Looking back at it now, if she hadn't uh, worked it out and printed and published it, it would probably not have become well known at that time. And if it had not become well known at that time, I doubt if it would have survived. Never did I imagine to be taken prisoner, never. And I, I'm being quite honest, I was ashamed at the time. It was damn bad luck that the Highland Division didn't get away because, uh, well, they were just surrounded and that was it. We all thought, I think, that uh, we'd probably be killed or wounded or something like that. But the idea of taking, being taken prisoner never occurred to me, certainly. Uh, you, my memory is fading. You must realise it is, what was it, 56 years ago. In June 1940, 10,000 soldiers from Scotland's 51st Highland Division were forced to surrender on the north coast of France after weeks of heavy fighting. They were to spend the next five years as prisoners of war. Ironically, out of their captivity came an extraordinary and lasting legacy. A new Scottish country dance created by three of the officers, Jim Atkinson, Harris Hunter and Peter Oliver. We were both 21 and we went up to uh, Broughty Ferry, I think it was, where um, the uh, headquarters were in a hotel, and they embarked in five days. So I was married for five days, and saw him again um, over five years afterwards. The real of the 51st Division, I think, that name was given to it after it had got home. We called it the 51st Country Dance at that time. snow on the first day of the year, but during the past fortnight it has been cold and wet. Scottish country dancing has been going great guns, and some of the Sassenachs are beginning to pick it up quite well. With the gathering of forces at the beginning of World War II, the 51st Highland Division was assembled from thousands of volunteers, territorials and professional soldiers. Practically every village and town in Scotland was represented. Whole communities were left without men. Everybody joined, really. It was like joining your golf club or your tennis club or what have you, and you just felt, well, you joined and that was it. I looked forward to the day when I was going to be called up. I thought this was going to be a great adventure, like, you know. But I was soon to learn otherwise. Hitler's armies already occupied much of Europe, and the British Expeditionary Force, including the 51st Highland Division, was driven down through France by the advancing Germans. In desperation, Churchill ordered the evacuation of over 300,000 men from Dunkirk, but the 51st Highland Division was separated from them and ordered to retreat south along the coast in the expectation of a second mass evacuation. There were 185,000 British troops left in France after Dunkirk, and we were really the only formed fighting division. See, a lot of people don't know that that many British forces were left in France. No, it's something that's never entered the consciousness of most of the public. I don't know why. Possibly because they were largely Scottish. And that wasn't uh, of much interest down south. Well, I expected to be in France perhaps, say, uh, six months and then get home and leave. 
But uh, the way things were going, it was really impossible because we were being pushed all the time by the, the Germans. And we were uh, outside Dunkirk, or well, a good bit outside, and we were practically driven right down the coast till we finished up at St Valerie. We could have got back quite easily from our position to Cherbourg or somewhere like that. We had to go at the speed of the French, and we were motorised, and they were horse-drawn. So if we withdrew at our speed, we'd have left them in the lurch. If the war office had decided to take us out, they could have done. But that was a political decision, and they didn't. We, would, we had to remain there in order that others would get away. And it was definitely a sacrifice. And I believe this uh, came from uh, Prime Minister Churchill himself. But we didn't know at the time this was a sacrifice. It was gorgeous weather, absolutely still and perfect June weather. And St. Mary is bang opposite here. And the, um, the sky was absolutely black for about two feet up from, if you see what I mean, it's very untechnical, from the horizon, absolutely black against the, the, um, from the guns. And we could hear the guns quite clearly. We entered San Valerie and found it packed with civilians and other soldiers, French, what have you. The place was uh, burning all around us, tracer bullets all around us and what have you. Exploding. And I'd one look at the place and, oh my gosh, I said, we'll never get away from this, this is it. I'm quite sure the cat came in to rescue us from here. We were told prior to a uh, Fighting the fire that the boats would come in, certain boats would come in. There was a bit of a, a mist in the sea, a bit of fog, and of course there was, they wouldn't allow the boats to come in. I could see from St. Valley up the coast, there was a little place called Verley Rose. There was a boat there. So we set off, my bodies and I, to try and get onto the boat. And unfortunately, when we arrived there, we found the boat was aground. So we all clambered aboard. But unfortunately, the Germans brought up a field gun on the cliff above and started chilling. So there was no future staying on the, on the boat. So we all had to clamber out and wade ashore. That's how I was taken prisoner. The beach was, uh, was a messy business, but a lot of French and British had been trying to go over the cliffs. And they'd let themselves down with rifle slings. And some of them had broken, so they'd landed. Uh, and there was quite a lot of bodies lying spread eagle along the side of the cliff. A nasty sight. In the chaos of the battle for St. Valerie, the order was given that it was every man for himself. I was sheltering in the cliff side and a sergeant of the Camerons spotted me there and he shouted to me to come with him to the lighthouse. So we both moved to the lighthouse. It was open ground and Rommel's Army Corps were, the tank corps were up on top of the cliff. I thought I had no chance, but I just, I had to obey the order. And it was there when we reached the lighthouse, the sergeant, he moved up to the top, into the, onto the small veranda outside the lighthouse with a machine gun. And I followed up with the ammunition. But within seconds he was shot right across the head and he dropped. They were all told to smash their guns and um, or to get rid of them or something. And he was smashing his gun up against a tree. And my husband said that he, he was practically in tears because it was such a, a dreadful thing to happen for the 51st to be um, a surrender, which they hadn't ever done before. When, with our guns etc. destroyed on that fateful morning of 12th June 1940 at St. Valerie, the 51st, a political pawn in the game, capitulated to the ring of German armour. I was on the beach, taking, on the order of our general, what men remained with me. I surrendered to General Rommel personally in the village square. The German panzer troops, with good reason, were in high fettle, while we, frankly, 
were in the depths of despondency. We were just marshaled together by the Germans, and one German soldier came over, he was near me, and he said to me, for you, the war is over. <laughs> I said, oh, well, we'll see. The Germans must have been taken by surprise. They had millions of Frenchmen and thousands of British. And the, the roads in France must have been full of columns of prisoners marching toward Germany. The quite honest, it was pretty rough indeed. They were sometimes what we call trigger happy. If you stepped out of line, you got a shot. And there was quite a number were shot and they're left at the side. And of course, you took your life in your hands, scrambling for food on the way, anything that was in the ground at all. I even stopped to get some potato peelings. So precious to me it was. It was the endless rhythm of the marching feet that inspired Jim Atkinson to think up a new reel. In order to take my mind off the immediate surroundings, I amused myself by considering making up a country dance based on the insignia of the Highland Division, which was at that time St Andrew's Cross. And I thought I could arrange it in two diagonals and finish up with a circle or something of that sort that would make quite a decent dance. Thereafter, it was worked out more fully, but at the seed of the idea certainly occurred to me on the march. The Germans had taken hundreds of thousands of prisoners and force-marched them across Europe to camps in Germany and Poland. Officers were then separated from other ranks. They marched for three weeks, covering up to 20 miles a day with rations of thin soup and occasional bread. With many suffering from dysentery, they were packed into barges and then cattle trucks until they reached the first of several camps. Today, Offlag 7C has been converted into private homes and is barely recognisable as the former prisoner of war camp. Laufen was a horrid place. It was a huge, big German castle. And it was horrid because there wasn't enough food. We were overcrowded. We didn't know what the future held. Um, there was a horrible camp commandant there. Uh, it was by far the worst camp as far as I can remember. But mind you, we went, when we got to Laufen, we weren't particularly experienced prisoners of war. It was only later that we learned how to cope with the situation better. We arrived at Laufen in the dark and didn't see much, we put in a big shed and we had all our clothes taken away to be fumigated because it was quite a good thing because we had been on the move for th three weeks and without the, we needed a wash and we were given a hot shower and had our heads shaved right down to a, a shining skull. The Germans came up, you see, and took off my bonnet, just whipped an electric razor over my head and this chap, my left, said, oh, bad luck, Sandy, you've lost your hair but you must have bugs. So he goes along to the guardsman, takes off his bonnet and says, looks all through his hair and he's all smiling sweetly. Just, Boom! And this gorgeous blonde boy lost every lock of hair on his head. They did everybody. Oh, to begin with, hunger was terrible. I mean, we were young and we weren't getting enough food. And really, that's all you thought about. You lay in your bed at night and you, you dreamed of great feasts. If we kept on at the level of food we were getting, starvation would have set in within two or three months. And in fact, our room was at the top of three long flights of stairs. It was quite an effort to go up and down them. In fact, I had to rest every time I got to a landing before I went on the next lot. In a normal-sized room, one would have 30 or 40 people with wooden bunks 
three and sometimes four high on the wall. So you were absolutely hugger-mugger with people and you soon got to know who snored and who didn't and whose feet smelt and who didn't and so on. There were no intimate data, d details from anybody. We, we got a, a certain amount of stuff from, from the Red Cross and uh, from parcels, food, uh, clothes parcels from one's uh, relatives. But after a while, jerseys and things and socks had run out. And so what one had to do was unravel the jersey and, and, and all the socks, uh, the, the worn-out bits were discarded, and then re-knit the whole thing, and re-knit jerseys, and very often make them two strands instead of one and make them thicker. And I used to do quite a lot of bit knitting. I was taught by somebody in the camp. I couldn't turn a heel until we discovered somebody who was able to work it out from first principles on a, on a graph paper, how you did it. And after that, I learned how to turn a heel. It's quite difficult. I'll never forget, we were about three stories up, and this chap was in the next room, dressed up more or less, and there was a single window. And this chap had a sketch pad, was sketching away, doing things. And the chairman in the centre box shot him. And it was a wall like that, a fly couldn't have got down it. And we were all we felt dreadful about it. Bolling, what would you do? They sent a German general around. He was armed, of course, and his guard guard. We didn't see him, I suppose the general saw him, but oh, it caused very, very bitter feeling. I mean, they shifted the guard right away, but we were bitterly. I mean, unarmed men, you couldn't do anything in them, even if you wanted to. Just one of the bad ones, I suppose, I don't know. But it stuck all of us, particularly the youngsters, because it was just beside us, you know. And there it was, war. Even though they were at a low ebb, mentally and physically, the men slowly regained their strength. With the arrival of Red Cross food parcels, their spirits improved, and as the officers were not expected to work, they had to look for ways to fill their time and ease the boredom. Well, I think they had, did all sorts of things in the prison camp. Uh, in fact, because uh, a lot of them were, in fact, territorial soldiers, a great many of them had uh, different skills. And uh, I can certainly remember my father telling me that they could put everything from a, a West End production to a modern uh, uh, dancing group. There'd always be somebody who had done it professionally, they would be there. Using their own resources, they studied, gave lectures, played bridge, and tried to escape. For many, Scottish country dancing became a regular activity. And we had to keep our minds occupied with something. There wasn't very much to keep our tummies filled, but if we could keep our minds cracking, well, that was something. And I discovered uh, that Highland dancing was going on in the camp, so I joined myself to that and got quite proficient at doing a number of both Highland and country dancing. Some of the officers began to a country dancing class and they used the long corridor outside the hospital block, which was on the first floor, if I remember rightly, because it was suitable for the type of dancing. And during that time, I remember there was a couple of officers had uh, invented a dance, which I now know as the dance of the 51st Division. Well, we were dancing the, the, the reel in a, in a hut, which was... Uh, we were the ordinary sort of size army hut, you see, there was a room there. And we were mostly in battle dress and tackety boots. And we, it, it, it is not unlike any other country dance, we all lined up. And we were dancing in shirt sleeves and in a battle dress trousers. They were the 51st Division, they were all Scottish regiments, and they'd all dance dances and um, uh, Scottish reels in, in all their balls that they had in each regiment. So they were all fairly proficient anyway. 
you know, people who'd never heard of Scottish dancing before in their lives were doing it because it was something fun to do. Well, we'd go through a certain uh, movement and then Peter, whoever it was, I suppose the Jamaicans and was there as well, would have said, no, I think we probably want that one second and this one first. So we'd go and do it again. And then they'd change their mind again, so we'd do it another way. Arguments say I was number one and I was moving to number two position. And like a stupid idiot, I'd go to three. So that somebody in there would pull me back and lead me to number two, you see, and then lead me through the whole thing up to eight. And if you got it, oh yes, I've got it, so go back to the beginning. Gosh, I'd missed it again, you know, but that, that sort of thing, like, like schoolboys being sort of pushed through their paces, you know. Uh, we got it eventually. It took time, but we got it. Some better than others. I have a feeling that they wanted to send the music and the dance home. But for some reason the Germans wouldn't let it go, whether they thought it was a code, I don't know. They sent the movements of the dance on these letter cards that they sent home. And presumably they, they started off by saying, you know, uh, set to the right, set to the left, and, and, and so on. And uh, the Germans thought that, you know, they were hauled up anyway after these letters had been censored, they all were. And they said, what's all this, you see, because they thought it was a code. Jim Atkinson, Peter Oliver and Harris Hunter all tried to send the dance home. It was Mrs. Harris Hunter who eventually received the dance and tried out the new steps with her Scottish Country Dance Club, which she had kept going through the war during her husband's captivity. really was that it was nearly all ladies, uh, plus maybe the odd uh, youngster like myself who had been taken by uh, mum. Looking back at it now, if she hadn't uh, worked it out and printed and published it, it would probably not have become well known at that time. And if it had not become well known at that time, I doubt if it would have survived. If you take the city of Perth at that time, I just think there wasn't a family that didn't have somebody in the, in the 51st Town Division. And so I should think uh, most of the people who country danced, uh, the husbands were away. During the war, Laurel Bank was one of the many schools evacuated to the safety of the countryside. Well, we had the dancing in here, and the children came, and they danced. Well, we taught them simple dances first, and then the more advanced ones for the older ones. One of the teachers, Annie Sesford, had also received the dance steps from her brother, another prisoner of war. She taught the new reel to the girls. Well, they were very excited about it because it was a very sketchy program I got from my brother in the prisoner of war camp, just on a lot of notes, and uh, we didn't know what tune it would be. To, they didn't have a proper tune, so we used one of the tunes that we had here. We didn't realise the significance of the time, although Miss Sesford mm. had always said that her brother, who was a prisoner of war, had been dancing this one in the prisoner of war camp. Yes, she told us it had been made up by the men in the prisoner of war camp and she had a postcard that she held up in her hand and told us what the steps were. This is the rule of the 51st Division. Set. Cast off two. Lead up. 
you miss the voice of children, which you've never heard. And I think you probably missed the female voice because you hadn't heard it either, really. You saw them maybe well way in the far side of the wire, but that was about as near as you got. Balance. Circle. And back. Now that couple's going to do it again and again, same again. At the end of the war, the men were liberated by the Allies. Five years after their capture, the soldiers were finally to come home. You felt slightly guilty, I suppose, that you'd failed. Um, and you clamped up and it was a bit of your life which was totally wasted. Five blooming years. And um, you just wanted to forget about it. And you also, I remember being terrified of a telephone, things like that. Um, I suppose one would call it being institutionalised now. But you got out of the way of taking decisions for yourself and... Um, but I can't really exactly remember why one camped up, but uh, I did, and I know I wasn't alone. And I hated talking about it for many, many years afterwards. I always felt that uh, we'd lost a chunk of our youth unnecessarily. But in the scheme of things, I suppose it was necessary. If I wasn't in camp, I would have probably been elsewhere. Probably have no youth to lose, I don't know. We went back from, uh, we were picked up by the American, it was Patton, the Patton Army, the Army, and taken to a repatriation camp. And then we were flown by Lancaster back home. And uh, as we were crossing the channel, the pilot said over the intercom, if you look out of the window, you'll see the White Cliffs of Dover. So I said, I don't want to see the White Cliffs of Dover, I want to get back to Aberdeen. <laughs> he couldn't quite see appreciate it. Extraordinary coming in. The thing that struck me more than anything were the voices. I could hear the voices of the porters on the platform. And thought, God, we're in Scotland. Well, I think the fact that it's endured for so long makes it a wonderful memorial to the 51st Division. I think it's terrific.